about survival in these magnificent creatures and many blood frogs. So we'll start by transporting us all to the pristine rainforest of Panama. And while this is an amazing place to do field work, it wasn't the best place to be an amphibian in the early 2000s. And that is because of this pathogen, the amphibian chytrid fungus. I'll mostly be calling it BD throughout the talk. So this is what BD looks like under a microscope, but typically it's living on the skin of amphibians. Um, and in susceptible species, it can rapidly cause death due to um, osmotic balance being, being thrown off. And so this caused a lot of declines in Panama, but the um, happy story today is that amphibians are actually recovering in this ecosystem. So this is data that, that we published last year looking at how many, how many of these different uh, species we were finding in our surveys uh, before the disease, uh, during the disease outbreak, the epizootic, and then post-outbreak in the last five or six years, while the disease is in this enzootic state. You can see um, increasing population numbers across a lot of species. Of course, not all of them. Some of them um, have yet to recover. So what we're focusing on today, of course, is the Panamanian gold frog. So this is an individual we captured in 2015. This is an Adelopus varius. We'll be talking about two species today, varius and Kateki. You can see they're, uh, they're not the best set of avoiding plants because they're highly, highly toxic. But um, today we're talking about how and why these Adelopus uh, are persisting, perhaps even recovering in Panama. And so when you're investigating any disease outcome, I think it's helpful to use the disease triangle as, as a framework. We know that this outcome is, is the product of the interaction between the host, the pathogen, and their shared environment. And so changes in any one of these things could lead to um, the different outcomes that we're seeing. So let's see what we know in this system about each of these uh, parts of the triangle. And we'll start with our pathogen. And so we know uh, from studies done in the lab that BD is still virulent in Panama. And so we're looking at survival curve here, uh, testing Adelopus various that have been infected with BD that was collected either sort of at the height of the outbreak in 2004 or um, in more recent years, in 2013, we see no difference in the curves. So this is telling us BD is still as deadly as it ever was. Um, doesn't seem to be a lot of changes there. What do we know about the environment? And so here we're looking at a map of our sampling sites and also a PCA from, from biofilm variables from that site. The takeaway here is that we have survivors in those green circles in a lot of different locations in a lot of different environments. So we have survivors in the lowlands uh, and then up in the high mountains, um, kind of span the hot, cool, wet, dry um, climate space. And so a lot of work in Australia has shown that some survivors from BD are due to these um, special climactic refugia, which are good for the frogs, bad for bad for the pathogen. But here, it doesn't seem to be the case. So. That's really kind of pointing us to perhaps there's some change in the host that, that might be mediating survival. And in fact, we have some evidence uh, <laughs> suggesting this. And so this is, again, from that same study, um, showing us that Adelopus various uh, contemporary survivors, they're antimicrobial peptides, so these are produced by the skin to fight off pathogens, are actually more, in, more inhibitory against BD in the lab than those of their um, historic historic populations. And so all of this preliminary data is really motivating our study. But first, I think it's fun to kind of situate the study in like the more historic timeline of studying these, these frogs in Panama. And it's all made possible by uh, work done by Corey richards Wacky. Um, back in the early 2000s, she was conducting her PhD on these animals. Uh, and that's right about the time that BD swept through. And so really kind of a dramatic time of seeing your entire study species um, decline before your eyes, seeing whole populations disappear. Uh, but because of her work, we have this really rich historic data set, um, samples from collected throughout the range in Panama that are really making uh, my study possible. Uh, around the same time, Adelopus were being brought into captivity, <coughs> captively reared. Uh, so these are, are still, still going on today. And so there's a really robust uh, captive population in Panama. Um, 2009 was when the last Adelopus techie was found in the wild. And so sadly, this, this species looks like it might be extinct in the wild. Um, and then this is uh, from 2012 to 2016, we went out to all of these historic Adelopus sites. And we 
collected, uh, conducted three surveys. So looking mostly for Adelopus, but of course collecting data on all the amphibian communities to see what was happening there. Um, we ended up finding 60 Adelopus variants uh, over these, these over this period uh, from five different localities, which I showed you in the map earlier. And that brings us to the study I'm presenting on today, which is our genomic analysis. So how can we leverage the, this amazing historic data set uh, paired with our these contemporary survivors after this really intense uh, uh, die-off event? So how much genetic diversity is remaining? So we're doing some basic population genetics on these uh, individuals, and how are these outlooks surviving? Um, where are the survivors coming from? And are there any genes that might be highly associated with, uh, with the contemporary populations? So here's what we did. We decided to do an exome capture, and so um, amphibian genomes are gigantic, and we needed a way to sort of reduce our sequencing, but we wanted to do it in a, in a meaningful way, and so we decided to uh, sequence the transcriptome of a few individuals at varying disease levels, uh, annotate those transcripts, and then design a capture based on all of our annotated transcripts. And so trying to capture the entire exome as best as we could. We sequenced 130 historic, 39 contemporary, so that was as many as we could get DNA out of, and uh, 18 captive Adelopus. We mostly used angst for our data. Our target size was about 15,000 genes, um, and we had lots of SNPs, really robust data set. All right, so let's jump into some of the results. So I'll show you a few PCAs just to kind of visualize the, the variance in our genetic data here. So we see PC1 generally separating our species out. I will uh, just put a little box around them to orient you. So our various here on the left and Zetekin on the right. If we change the colors based on the populations, kind of depicted in the map up there, we can see that population structure really strongly matches the geography. So really strong isolation by distance uh, patterns in our data. If we change the colors once more to illustrate kind of where um, some of these, so where the captive populations are coming from, which is in the red triangle, we can see that there's just a few populations of various on the left and just one population of Zuteki currently present in, in the um, populations in Panama. And so um, while it's great that we have these captive colonies, it's sort of limited in scope. Uh, one more thing to point out from this, PCA is there's actually two triangles here on the left, uh, and that is the captive and the historic, sorry, the contemporary and the historic Adelopus various. And so this is really telling us that these survivors are coming from uh, these really distantly related populations. And so while this is, is good news, there seems to be um, sort of these, these remaining populations kind of preserving the, the historic genetic diversity. We do, of course, see that overall genetic diversity, looking at um, nucleotide diversity and stuff like that, that has decreased as expected from, from this really dramatic bottleneck. If we take a closer look at some of these specific populations where we have survivors, um, we're looking at three here where we have our most samples. Uh, so there's two interesting patterns going on. So the, on the right, we have two populations here. I I have one. There it is. Um, so we really kind of see what we expect. So the, the contemporaries in red, they're kind of nested within the historic um, samples, and so this is really telling us that they're closely related to their historic counterparts. They're kind of um, just surviving in place. <coughs> but if we look at Tigreo, now this place, this is special because this is actually where we have three quarters of our contemporary samples from. It's from this one population. And so it's really kind of a stronghold of, of this species in Panama. And we see this really interesting pattern of the contemporaries being um, really diverse here, and then the historic kind of being all of the same genotype. We can, we can see more of this in the next plot, but first I'll tell you that while this is interesting, of course, uh, the genetic diversity is still decreased uh, in these contemporaries. If we look at a structure plot that we really just only have to focus over here on that one population I was talking about, but we can see that generally by location, you have pretty much more or less one genotype except for in these contemporary T. Guerrero samples. Um, while historic is kind of all the same, these contemporaries, there's almost three different genotypes going on. And so a really interesting, kind of, we're not exactly sure what's going on. It could be maybe recent migrants, or you know, these are genotypes that we weren't capturing before, but um, we have a really interesting case study here. 
Uh, if we look at the data, this is kind of a little fun aside, we can actually, in that Tuguerero population, uh, reconstruct some whole family trees here. Uh, and so we were able to identify you know, the Santaxi pair in 2013 and some of the, the babies they produced in 2014, uh, which is kind of fun and cool, but also necessary for our, our selection study down the road. So we had to kind of trim out some of these uh, highly related individuals before going into that. So now let's talk about the selection studies uh, made possible by our paired historic and contemporary samples. So what we did was we, we did two different comparisons. Uh, we're a little limited by sample size, of course, but doing the, the best we can. And so we decided to compare the T. Guerrero contemporaries and historic, so kind of controlling for, for the geographic variation, and then compare all of the historic Adelopus areas to all of the contemporary survivors from every population. And so we did our comparisons by looking at FST outliers uh, using just the genetics, <coughs> using sliding windows, and then doing an association test in angst generate some, some lists, and here we're taking a broad approach and kind of just looking at, um, trying to generate further hypotheses for testing. And so what did we find? So in T. Guerrero, we found uh, a list of, of candidates for and kind of went through and we wanted to see, is there anything interesting in this list? And we found some actually really interesting genes here that I think warrant future investigation. One being RNAs1, uh, which is associated with you know, immune system response to fungus. And so we saw this, we were like, oh wow. That, and other studies have found this gene to be associated with, with coronavirus uh, in response to that. So we also found an antimicrobial peptide gene in our list. And so if you remember from what I told you before, this could be really important. In our complete Adelopus various comparison, we found seroprotease inhibitors uh, in our list. And so this is important because one of the main virulence factors for we think it are serine proteases, so um, could be relevant there. And also, both well, sodium, sodium channels, which we think are important for, for amphibian skin. I'll go through this. Also, we, we looked at some of the shared uh, genes here, which we have um, a list. They're from all different biological processes, uh, and we're looking forward to looking more into this list uh, to generate our, our candidates. So, in conclusion, our Adelopus are mostly surviving in place from, from their historic populations, but this one interesting kind of stronghold um, maybe has some visit migrants and also has some successful recruitment, which we're really excited about. Genetic diversity is decreased, but we, uh, using this pair study, we've been able to identify some few genes that might be important and that warrant future investigation. So I'd like to acknowledge especially uh, this amazing team of women scientists and mentors that have been uh, so, so great to work with, and uh, the Rose Bloom Lab. Thank you all for listening.